To reiterate, norm s dist gives the probability of finding your z-score or less if you have a normal distribution. Alternatively, it is the area under the standard normal curve to the left of that value. Now we want to look at an example problem going in the other direction, that is, what do we do when we are looking for a percentile? Recall, a percentile is the value at or below you would expect to find a given percent of the data. What z-score gives the 75th percentile? This is the same thing as saying or asking, this is the score that separates the lower 75% of the distribution of all possible z-scores in an SND from the upper 25%. If I were to write this in mathematical notation, my bastardized notation would look something like this. P of z less than what value of x would give me 0.75 or 75%. Fortunately, there is a function in Excel that does this. The key to remember is that Excel calculates everything from the left. For the norm s dist function, we gave it a z-score and it returned a percentage, or more appropriately, an area. But the area is the proportion of the total area under the curve and thus can be interpreted easily as a percent. But it's the area to the left. This new function will go the other way. We will give the function a percent and it will return the z-score. Here's a quick sketch of this bell curve. I know there is some point along the horizontal axis at which the area to the left of this line under the curve is 75%. I want to know where to put this green line, and that is what we are asking here. Where do I need to position this line to get this shaded area to be 75%? And that is what this new function in Excel does, equals norm s inv. Again, the s stands for the standard normal, and the inv stands for inverse. Excel is smart enough to know that 75% can be written in a number of different ways. For example, 75%, 0 0.75, or even 3 quarters. They all will return the same result. The result is 0.674. Again, let's think back to the empirical rule to determine if this makes sense. If this area is 75%, the upper, unshaded portion is 25%. The mere lower 25% removed from the shaded 75% would give us the middlemost 50%. So the question is whether or not this seems like the correct boundary value for the upper part of the middlemost 50%. Well, the count by thirds rule suggests this should be about two thirds, and 0.674 is indeed close to 0.667. What I'd like to do now is to connect this concept to every possible normal distribution. Up until this point, we have only been talking about the standard normal distribution. Thus, this means we've only been talking about z-scores. But there's an advantage we can exploit here. If we take any normal distribution, we can convert it to a standard normal distribution by transforming all the values into z-scores. This is why we spent so much time at the beginning of the term talking about z-scores. Z-scores are what allow us to connect all normal distributions to each other. For any data set, there is some mean and standard deviation. We will take these as some given values. If we know our population is normally distributed, I want to convert my data into a new data set using these values. The new data set should have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So the population mean for the z-scores, mu sub z, is 0, and the population standard deviation for the z-scores, sigma sub z, is 1. And here's the golden goose. The z-scores for any normally distributed distribution are a standard normal distribution. That, that, is why we, that is why this proves to be so extremely important. I'll repeat that. The z-scores for the scores for any normal distribution are a standard normal distribution. So if we have the normal distribution of our x values, we could draw a sketch of the curve. It has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. This is the distribution of the values of x. If we convert these to z-scores, we get the same shape distribution, but the mean is now at 0, and the standard deviation is 1. And the data in this distribution are the z-scores. So how do we do this conversion? Well, we just use the z-score formula. To go from x to z, we use the fact that z is the difference between x and the mean divided by sigma, or how far each value is above or below the mean measured in standard deviation units. With this approach, we can now talk about the probabilities associated with any normal distribution. Let's work on an example. 
we will work with the Stanford Binet IQ test scores. I won't elaborate much on this measure here, but I will say that for those interested, these scores are psychometrically flawed on many levels, not the least of which is the introduction of racial bias into the assessment items. However, the protocol to generate the scores does indeed produce very nearly normal data. The question that has yet to be resolved is what the scores actually measure. There once was a time when, as an adult, announcing in public that you had taken an IQ test was very taboo. Simply put, it would have suggested something less desirable at the time of their creation. But again, I won't elaborate here, but I'll encourage those of you interested in this to explore this with independent research on the topic. With that said, let's talk about the general protocol for how the intelligence quotients, which is what IQ stands for, how the intelligence quotients were calculated. Using past data on the average performance for a child's age group, say 10-year-olds, an individual score was divided by this average score and then multiplied by 100. When children from different age groups were combined, the data was very nearly normally distributed. The mean was at 100 and the standard deviation was about 16, which has been scaled down to 15, but the historical rationale for why this happened is not entirely evident, though it supports the count by thirds empirical rule quite nicely. And the use of this instrument still persists today, even with all the flaws and concerns. But the scores do generally follow a normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Assuming we are working within this distribution, what is the probability of randomly selecting a 10-year-old with an IQ of 106 or less? What we are asking is P of X less than or equal to 106. We will take advantage of the fact that we can convert this value to a z-score. This results in the probability of finding a z-score less than or equal to 106 minus 100, all divided by 15. This is 6 over 15, or 2 fifths, or 0.4. To get this from Excel, we only need to enter norm sdist 0.4, and we get the value 65.5%. Now, let me graphically show what's happening here. So let me go back to R. So let's do plot bell. So I want to do 106, but this time mu equals 100 and sigma equals 15. All right, so this is the area that I'm asking for. So you see that I've kind of marked off the scale here. So this is 100, this is 115, these are by five. So 100, 105, 110, so that's 106. We've shaded the area to 106 and to the right, and that's an area of 65.5%. Uh, now I'm gonna scoot this over so you can see what happens to the graph when I change. So I'm gonna go ahead and type now plot.bell of, of the z-score of 0 0.4. Watch, watch what changes on this graph. All right, ready? Did you catch that? All that changed was the, the scale down here changed to z-scores everything else remained exactly the same. Let's work a similar problem, but going in the other direction. We will continue to work with the Stanford Binet IQ test. Now let's determine what is the probability of randomly selecting a 10 year old with an IQ of 82 or higher. P of X greater than or equal to 82. This would be equivalent to finding the probability of a Z score greater than or equal to 82 less 100 all divided by 15, which is the same as a z-score greater than negative 18 over 15, or z greater than or equal to negative 1.2. And here's where we see the empirical rule fails us, not just because it is only an approximation. With the count by thirds empirical rule, I can approximate this value if z were greater than negative 1, or greater than negative 4 thirds, but I can't get this precise for values between 1 and 4 thirds using just the empirical rule. This is why we need the Excel function. It can provide not just all the values in between 1 and 4 thirds, but it also provides accurate values and not just approximations. First, I will take advantage of the rule of complements. This is the same thing as 1 less the probability of the opposite happening. The opposite of z greater than or equal to negative 1.2 is z less than negative 1.2. This is now written in a form that allows me to use the function I have in Excel. In Excel, we would enter equals 1 minus norm s dist negative 1.2, which returns the value of 0.8849 and change, or about 88.5%. And graphically, that would look like this. 
plot.bell. So we're looking at 82 or higher, mu equals 100, sigma equals 15, and the direction is to the right. And that is the graph that we would expect to see. So this total shaded area, so an IQ of 82 or above, there is an 88.5 or about an 89% chance of finding an individual with that IQ or higher. My hope now is to use Excel to make your life a little bit easier. It turns out there's a different function built into Excel that allows me to skip this step, the step where we convert the data value to a z-score. Instead, I will give the function in Excel more information from the problem, and it will carry out the necessary intermediary steps for me. As a consequence, this function has more flexibility than the standard normal distribution function. Here's the problem we will use. The heights of four-month-old saplings are normally distributed with a mean of 36 inches and a standard deviation of 4.7 inches. Our question, what is the probability of randomly selecting a sapling that will be 25 inches or less? The mathematical notation would be p of x less than or equal to 25. The function we want to use is the norm dist function. There is no s in the middle. This is not the norm s dist function. The first argument is the value 25. Recall, Excel always gives the area to the right, and this problem is asking for the area under the normal curve to the left of 25, less than 25. The next value we enter is the mean, which is 36, and then the standard deviation, which is 4.7. We enter these two values next. The last thing we enter is true, and we always enter true. This is the structure of how this function is written. We always need to give it these four arguments. This function has a built-in question at the end. That question is, do you want the area or not? And since we do, that is why we enter to true. It would return something other than the area if we had said false. For those of you interested, false returns the height of the curve, not the area to the left of that point under the curve. Again, what this function does is take this information and calculate the z-score, then it finds the area under the standard normal distribution, the SND, to the left of that z-score. If I punch that into Excel, I get the value 0 0.0096, or about 1%. If I do plot bell, we want to look at 25. Uh, mu equals 36, sigma equals 4.7. So this is the plot here. All right. So I'm looking at about 1% of the area. So the means are, the mean is at 36. It, this is marking off every standard deviation. So I guess 4.7 below, another 4.7. And if I'm looking at a value at about 25 and below, what we're seeing is a, a z-score of about 1%. Now if I look, that's at about, that's, so this is one, zero standard deviations, one, two, and a third standard deviations below. So once again, what we're seeing is the, the empirical rule that we've been working with actually seems to do, a, a, the, the empirical rule does a good job of approximating these areas associated with the bell curve.